Hello and welcome back for another episode of Component Level Board Repair. So today, as with all these videos, we're going to try to walk you through figuring out what's wrong with a board that's dead and not powering on. And there's a lot of thought in the, this general community that you have to be an electronics engineer, you have to be a physicist, you have to be some, some level of genius in order to understand a lot of what's going on here. And one of the things that I try to do with this channel is I really try to distill it down to just being basic common sense and detective work to give you the idea that with just a little bit of learning and a little bit of just understanding some basic concepts that you can follow along and you can work on stuff like this and you can actually figure it out so long as you're willing to learn and have an analytical mindset. So let's go ahead and get into this board. This is an 820-2849 board and when I plug it in, you'll notice that I do get a green light, however, it doesn't power on. Now, Let's go over the uh, list of power rails, because the first thing I'm going to want to do in a no power condition is I'm going to want to look through the power rails and try to figure out which rail it is that's missing. So these machines are always going to have a number of different power lines. They're going to have a 12 volt line, a 5 volt line, a 3 volt line, a 1.5 volt line, a 0.75 volt line, and so on and so forth. And different lines are going to want to be on in different states. So for example, when the machine is sleeping, you're not going to want to have the CPU on, but you are going to want to have the RAM on so that it saves whatever you had, so that when you open the machine, everything shows up again. Or when it's off, you don't want to have the RAM or the CPU on, but you do want the battery to be charging so that when, you, when it's off, it charges the battery. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to go through a list of rails, and we're going to measure each one of these rails to see which one is going to show up and which ones don't show up. So over here, I'm just going to show you where I find my list of rails. Now, any good schematic or diagram is going to give you a list of the power rails that you should expect to have here. So we're going to start with PP Bus G3 Hot. And here we're going to use our handy dandy board view software in order to find each one of these rails. So the first rail that I'm going to look for is PP Bus G3 Hot. And this is a rail that's supposed to be, I believe, 8 point something volts on this model machine. So we're going to go ahead and measure it with the multimeter and see what the multimeter gives us. Let's try and get the multimeter so it's actually visible on the screen. There we go. So or barely visible in my case. Okay, so. We take our black probe and we put it on ground, because ground is going to be zero in this case. We take the meter and we turn it to DC voltage, which is going to be voltage with a flat line at the top, and then we place the black probe where we are looking for voltage to be. And the idea here is it's going to measure the difference between these two points. 8.33 volts. That's what I'm expecting. Now we're going to move on to the next rail, which is going to be PP3V42. Now PP3V42 is used for the one-wire circuit. If you don't know what the one-wire circuit is, you can watch some of my older videos on what the one-wire circuit is. Long story short is that the one-wire circuit is what's going to be used in order to give you a green light on the charger. So let's just fast forward over to that section so I can explain some of that for you. Now, the whole idea here is that this MagSafe DC power jack, when I say MagSafe DC power jack, that means this thing, the charger is going to talk to the rest of the machine. So the charger on this signal line is going to put out adapter sense, and that's going to go to this IC, U6900. From here, we see EXT. That stands for external, as in the charger. Now, it has another tab called INT, which is going to stand for internal. And this is where I see that it's really useful to be a detective, because you have to, you have to um, be willing to guess what some of these things mean and just kind of try to look at what's going on around in the area and just put it in a context. Then we see SIS1 wire. Now, SIS1 wire is going to go to something called the SMC. This chip over here that it's going to is U4900. This is an SMC chip. See over here, SMC. It's going to the SMC chip. Now, this circuit over here, this chip is, gets power on its VCC pin. Think about this. What's going to allow this chip to turn on? X is an external signal line. Int is an internal signal line. And C, not connected. Ground, zero volts, which by process of elimination leads us to pin one as the pin that it is going to receive power from. Now, that power is going to come from this chip. This chip, very simple. If you have power on A and B, it shoots out a signal on Y. That is going to be 3.42 volts. 
this is the power. This is the pin that provides this chip with the power it needs to turn on. And if you don't know what any of the pins mean, you can always Google this. And if you Google this little number, you'll find a data sheet on this chip where it tells you it receives power on pin 5, and if A and B are present, it gives you Y. Now, the power that this chip is going to need to turn on comes from here. The power this chip needs to turn on comes from PP3V42. So without PP3V42 present, we would not have a light, which means I, if any time I see that, I can skip over PP3V42. I know it's there. It has to be there. Now, one thing I noticed while I was yabbering and yabbering and talking on and on and on is that the board itself, while it was plugged in, actually got hot. Now, this is something that is going to come in handy. One of the things that you may notice on these rails is that some of them are suffixed with S5 or S3, and in some cases over here, SO. Let's talk about for that what those mean for a second, just in case you're somebody is new to the show who doesn't know what those mean. S5 is going to be a power rail that's on any time the computer is off. S3 is going to be a power rail that's on while the computer is sleeping. SO is going to be a power rail that's present when the computer is on. As I said before, there are certain rails that you're going to want to have on when the computer is sleeping, but not have on when the computer is off or on and anything like that. So for example, the backlight. You may want your RAM to have power while the computer is sleeping so that it remembers everything in memory. However, you're probably not going to want the computer's backlight to be turned on. So the backlight is an example of an SO power rail. Memory may be an example of an S3 power rail. And the CPU is going to be an example, or the graphics chip will be an example of an SO power rail. The only time we're going to want the CPU or the GPU to be on Oh, and the computer is on. So what I'm going to want to see at this point is if the machine is making its way to an SO state. The reason that this interests me is if the machine is in an SO state, I know that all the S3 and the S5 rails are present. If the machine is in an S3 state, I know all the S5 rails are present. In order to get to a higher state, all the power rails from the lower state have to be available. So I cannot make my way to an SO state with missing S3 rails. I can't make my way to an S3 state with missing S5 rails. And allow me to demonstrate how this is the case with some of the, the stuff here. So let, let's find, um, let's find some, some switches here to show you. So here's an example over here. 5 volt SO FET. Now, over here, this is a transistor, and the idea behind a transistor is that when you have, on this transistor, this specific type of transistor, when the power on the gate is lower than the power on the source, it will let voltage flow from here to here. So this is pretty much like a light switch that you can control with electricity rather than flipping a switch. You have PP5VS3 on the source, input, and PP5VSO on output. Now, the whole idea here is that if I don't have PP5VS3, I cannot get PP5VSO. There's not a set, there, there are no, there's not two separate sets of devices creating PP5VS3 and PP5VSO. There's one device that creates five volts. Here's five volts, and then you have these little switching transistors that decide when that five volts should go to these components versus those components. That's a switch that's going to take PP5ES3, a power line that's 5 volts in an S3 state, and it's going to send it to the components that require SO whenever you tell it to, so the CPU and so on and so forth. As you can see from the diagram, a lot of the different power rails are like that. So I can't get myself to an SO state if I'm not in an S3 state because the SO power rails are created from the S3, the S4, and the S5 rails. So what I'm going to do right now is I'm going to check to see if I'm in an SO state, meaning I'm going to check and see if an SO power rail is present. If I have my SO rail, that means two things. The first thing it means is that, I, that the computer is getting itself to the point that it's turning on. It is turning on. I am in an SO state. The second thing that it's going to mean if an SO rail is present is that everything before it has to be present. My S3s are present. My S5s are present. My G3 hots are present, which means I can cross those off the list of checking. And if I can cross those off the list, that makes the troubleshooting process that much easier. This is where thinking about sequence is going to save you a lot of time, hassle, and misery. So if I go through this list over here, you'll see. I have a G3 hot rail. G3 hot means be on all the time. S5 rail, be on when the machine's off. S3, I can ignore all those rails. And the only ones I'll have to check are the SO ones. So I'm going to check a rail that's pretty easy to check, PP5VSO. When I say easy to check, I mean easy to check because I know exactly where it is on every board. On all these boards, the, on the fan connector, on the pin to the left, that's always going to be PP5VSO, since these machines all use compatible fans. I know that it's always the same one. So if I have 5 volts there, did I plug this in right? Of course you didn't. So if I have 5 volts here, there we go. 
I'm in an SO state. So what I've done is I've now ruled out every single S3, S5, and G3 hot rail. That means I don't have to check those rails, which means that I can go ahead and only check SO rails to find the one that's missing. So PP5 ESO is present. Bam. Now I can go through here and I can say, okay, I need to check PP3 V3 SO, PP1 V8 SO, uh, CPU V core, PP1 V05 uh, SO, PP1 V2 SO, and I'm going to try to find the rail that itself is missing. So let's go through this and try to check those other rails. So I'm going to go over here and I'm going to open this and PP3 V3 SO. Let's check the rest of the rails and see which rail is missing. But now, see, I've saved myself a lot of time. There's a lot of rails that I don't have to check because most of the hard work has already been done. It's the way to minimize troubleshooting. Remember, one of the things that's key to making this economically viable to do as a service for uh, retail customers is coming up with ways to make the troubleshooting process a little bit quicker. Now, we're going to do this, and three point, close enough. I haven't changed the multimeter batteries in two years, so if it's off by a little bit, that's just fine. Now we're going to go over to the next rail, which is going to be... Let's see, we have PP1V8SO, PP1V8 underscore SO, and we have, I'm supposed to get 1.8 there, I'm guessing, 1.78, again, close enough, my multimeter batteries haven't been changed in quite a bit of time, and we're going to check another rail, we're going to check PP1V5S3RSO, I'm not sure if that's S3 or SO, What's, what is S3 RSO? Uh, who, the, who the hell knows? Um, five. That's something to look up later. I'm going to check you. And you're present on the other side of the board. That's fine. That's fine. We'll still find you. You don't get to hide from me. And that is um, 1.49. Again, close enough. And since it's close enough, I might as well reward myself with a little drink. All right, so we continue down the list of rails here. Uh, PP0V5, SODD, tongue twister. A lot of these are tongue twisters. Okay, we're going to measure this rail over here. What a tongue twister. Love to meet the people who came up with these names. Okay. Now is... Hmm. Am I looking at the right thing here? No, I'm not. Here we go. 871, close enough to 0.75. I really should replace the batteries in the damn multimeter. I, I never turn the thing off properly, and it's I really haven't replaced those batteries in like two years. I should be ashamed of myself. So PP1V5SO is next. Next time I go to the doctor, they go, do you drink? Because the last time I went to the doctor, I hadn't drank in a year. About a year. Do you drink? No. Recreationally? Next time they do that, I'm going to go, do, and they go, do you, drink? do you drink? No. Recreationally? No. Professionally. I drink professionally. 0 0.004. Does that sound like 1.5 volts to you? Let's analyze that section. Let's analyze what's going to create PP1V5 underscore SO. So if we were to analyze what creates PP1V5 SO, we will find our way to, come on. That's something that's powered by PP1V5 SO. I'm looking for where it's created. You got to find that. So we find our way. Here we go. See, the reason I know that this is where it's created is this is output. Everywhere else, PP1V5SO is going into something. But here, it's at the end of a circuit. And I'm correct. 1.5 volt SO regulator. This is a pretty basic circuit, if I could. So we have PP3V3S3, which we know is present because we have PP3V3SO, going to voltage in. That's going into the chip to power it. Then we also have PP3V3SO enable on pin 2. So this, this, this is very simple. If PP3V3SO is present as a rail, as long as PP3V3SO is present, meaning we're in an S3 state, then turn on this chip so pin 2 is enabled. So here's what I'm going to be interested in here. 
do I have power on pin 2 and 1? If I have voltage on pin 1, the chip is receiving power, it needs to work. If I'm getting power on pin 2, that means it's being told to work. So there's a difference between receiving the power you need to turn on and being told to work. So to give you an example with something, uh, let's see if I have any damn cord that's long enough. All right, so this is my microscope camera, right? Now this is me giving it power on the VN pin. This is me giving it power on the VCC or the VN pin. I'm going to take my adapter with power and plug it in. However, it's not being told to work. It has power if I want to use it, but to actually use it, I have to do this. I have to switch over to the microscope camera. And then when I switch into the microscope camera, you'll be able to see whatever I put under the microscope camera. Look, it's a little deer. It's a deer with a cross above his head. doesn't feel like 31%, 35% alcohol by volume. But that's the way that works. So, if we were to continue along here, I'm interested in what's on pin 1 and pin 2. And I'm also interested in seeing whether or not these feedback resistors are broken. The thing is, if feedback was missing, we would see a low amount, but I don't think we would see nothing. So I'm not quite about to blame those just yet. But you never know. So let's just do a little bit of investigating. We're going to find U7710 is going to be ISL8009. Let's try to find U7710 and see what's going on in that area. U7710 is right here. Let's take a look at that area under the microscope and see if we see anything that's particularly interesting. Maybe we'll see another deer. You never know. You never, never know. So, we're going to browse over to that area. And... Huh. Seems like I'm not the first person to be here. That transistor on the left is on a little bit crooked. And, yeah, that does not look like the original. Hmm. Seems like somebody's been here first. I hate when somebody beats me to it, but looks like somebody did indeed beat me to it. So we're going to just measure some of the things that I said we're interested in over here, which is going to be the voltage on pins 1 and 2. We're interested in both enable voltage and also voltage in. So let's take a look and see what we have on voltage in and also enable. Do keep in mind that we need both of these in order for anything to actually function. Now let's see if I can get these in camera. Can I get this in camera? Yeah, maybe, kind of, sort of, maybe. Eh. Got to move the keyboard up, got to do this, and, oh no, here we go. All right, so pin one, it's going to be power. Three point three volts, and pin two is going to be enable, and we got both. So we have enable and we have power going into the chip, but it's not creating output. Now, it could be a feedback resistor problem, or it could be an actual chip problem. And I'm kind of inclined, in this case, to blame it on the chip. Why? Because it looks like it's been screwed with, and that, that, just, that just tells me everything. So let's take a look here and get ourselves another chip. So I'm going to get myself another one of these chips. We're going to replace that. We're going to see if that fixes our problem. All right, so we got ourselves a replacement chip. Now it's just time to turn on the fume extractor, turn on the soldering equipment, and let's get to work. As always, if you're doing any of this type of work, you should be working with a... with an iron that isn't annoying as hell. Ah, the tip wasn't all the way in. Always remember to insert your tip all the way in. As always, you should always be working with a fume extractor. You don't want to breathe any of this shit in. And let's get to work. So first thing we have to do is remove this chip. It's going to require a little bit of hot air now just to make it come off just a little bit easier, less heat in the board. We're going to use some flux over here. Let's put some flux around the IC itself, and we're going to put a nozzle on the JBC and remove this chip from the board. We do want to be careful about heating the PCH because the PCH is right next door to this chip. As you can see, this over here is a chip that we do not want to heat. We do not want to heat that, yet it is right next to this, which is going to require some careful precision. So we're just going to lower the air on the hot air station. And let's go in. The first thing we're going to want to do, just make this process a little bit easier, is preheat the board. 
So preheating the board is going to be an important aspect here. We want to preheat it, the whole idea being that we don't want to burn and boil the chip and boil the first layer while the rest of the layer is good. Eh. So, we're just going to preheat it from a little farther away before we move in on the board. And I would say we give it about, the, about 30 seconds of that. Now, you could easily go out there and buy a board preheater. You could have a board preheater do this for you. Or if you're like me, you can simply heat the board from far away with a hot air station for a little while before you go in directly on the chip to remove it. It's up to you. It is up to personal preference what it is you want to do. And as always, you should use what works for you and allows you to get things done quickly and efficiently. I personally find I don't want a preheater on my desk because I have a tendency to, to be honest with you, I have a tendency to burn myself on it because I forget it's there all the time and then I just wind up cursing over and over again. So I tend to not use a preheater. I just simply tend to preheat the board from far away and then move in when I'm close to the temperature I want to be. Now the reason I'm doing the preheating is, let's say the board is 25 Celsius and I need this to be 217 Celsius to melt. If I heat the board, at 217, the board is going to constantly be absorbing the heat away from the solder joint. So I'm probably going to be at 100 or 150 Celsius, not 217, which means I got to raise the temperature of the hot air to four, 300 or 400 or 500. So now I'm going to be burning the chip to get this to two to um, be burning the chip to get the solder pads to 217 because the board is constantly absorbing the heat. So if the board itself is saturated with heat to the point where it cannot absorb more at a lower temperature like 200 Celsius or 150 Celsius, I don't have to use as much heat to actually remove the chip or do my soldering rework. See, watch how quick that's going to come off after preheating. See that? That's the power of a preheated board. Now we're, gonna, we're just going to clean up some of that solder there because I'm not quite sure what somebody did. It looks like there was work done there before. It looks like I am not the first person to be here on this board. It looks like I'm not the first person to be replacing this chip. Perhaps it failed because... It was just, it's time to fail, or perhaps it failed because it was, uh, you know, it was heated too much, or who knows? It, 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 maybe it just failed because it's, it, it's, it's something that's made by Apple. Again, you, you never, you never know. But let's just start from scratch here. We're just going to wick away that old solder. We're going to add our own solder in there and solder in a nice new chip. Put a nice, happy new chip and a happy new PP1V5 SO circuit for a happy board. Everybody's happy. Happy, 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 happy. Happy deer. That deer looks pretty happy. best if I use the micro pencil for this, but I think the micro pencil is hiding on Jason's desk, so I'll make this work. This is a very, very crowded area to be using this. Now remember, the solder pad, we don't want too much solder on, so I'm not even going to add any solder to my iron. I'm just going to use what's already there. Okay, now we're set, so what comes up next is going to be getting a chip to put on the board over here, and we'll be set. So, Let's get ourselves a chip. I'm going to get myself a chip. Move the air filter over, move this over. And we're going to preheat a board. The reason I don't put this under the microscope is because I don't want to have to put the chip down when I'm done. I don't want to put the chip down on the desk because it'll disappear, so I always keep the board that I'm working on under the microscope. Come on. If I go to Mouser to buy this, I find chips that are similar to this, but not quite exactly the same. So, what are you going to do?
Now I'm going to use a lower temperature than usual to actually solder a good one on there. I'll explain why in a second. Since now I can only guess what happened based on this thing drives me nuts. Yeah. I can only guess what happened based on hints and what I see here it looks like that has been replaced before. So what I'm guessing is that the one that was replaced failed. And there are I can only I, I can't I don't can't know exactly why, but I have to keep in mind that maybe the chip is just very sensitive to heat. So perhaps when the first individual replaced that chip, they used a little bit too much heat. I, again, I, I can only guess, right? I can only, only guess. I don't know if that's right, but it doesn't hurt to think about it. So I'm going to preheat from far away, same as before. We're going to preheat our chip. Nice and gentle with it. Take our time. I don't care if it's perfectly aligned just yet because we're not in the stage of wanting to solder it directly onto the board. I'm just in the stage of getting the board to be nice and warm. Not hot, just nice and warm. Get the board to a nice 150, 200 Celsius. Not not hot, just kind of a little bit warm. You know, some some comfortable vacationing temperature. Now, eventually, the flux is going to kind of blow itself away, and once the flux has blown itself away. I'll go in closer on the chip. The flux is going to kind of be my, uh, my way of telling what the temperature of the area is. Okay, push down. Beautiful. Got ourselves a nice, happy little chip. And we're going to... Wait for this to beep. Beep. Beep! Beep! Very good. Good little hackle. Take minimal time touching up the joints. And blow away some excess flux. And while it's still hot, that is the time to clean it. Again, we usually do ultrasonic these boards when we're done with them, but just for the meantime, it's easy. It's best to get off as much flux as you can while it's still hot. So I'm just going to fight with the alcohol dispenser a little, as you can probably hear in the background. And when I'm done fighting with the alcohol dispenser, we'll remove as much as we can while it's still hot. Again, you can remove this in the ultrasonic cleaner. The ultrasonic cleaner does heat up, but the ultrasonic cleaner heats up to, you know, 80 Celsius. If you can remove this stuff while the board is still at 150 or 200 Celsius, it makes the job a lot easier for the ultrasonic cleaner. So we've done that. Now we're going to see if we actually fixed our problem. So the first thing I'm going to do is just let that area of the board cool off a little bit. I'm just going to continue going over it with some nice cold alcohol because we did spend some time preheating it. So the cold alcohol is going to be a nice way to not just clean the board but also cool it off. And the alcohol, as you can see, is evaporating very quickly. It's 99% alcohol and also this board is still a bit warm. This is going to cool off the board nicely, and then after that, we're going to turn, try turning it on. Now I'm going to turn it on while it's in the microscope so that you can actually see whether or not it blows up again. So let's just plug this in and see if the chip actually blows up on camera. That would be pretty interesting, I think. It doesn't blow up. But what's more interesting here is you can see that we have a fan spinning. Oh, you don't believe me with the microscope picture, as you can see here. Look. Oh, you hear that? Fan spinning. It's beautiful. Now, let's see. Did that. Mm. Beautiful. So that's it for today. And as always, I hope you learned something. And do come back tomorrow for another episode of Component Level Board Repair.